Don't forget, here on our uh, announcement board, we have coming up uh, in February, so it's you know a couple weeks from now, but on February, the first Sunday of the month, there is our, after the morning service, our annual budget meeting. And that usually takes about 10 minutes. And then there's no evening service because it's the first Sunday of the month. Then in March, uh, we are, no, get to that later. On the 10th of February, we have the fo Foresters coming and they do some music and so forth and they'll be here for that. Then in March, we have uh, our Helps Missions that's on Sunday the 11th and Wednesday the 14th and we have our church anniversary on the 3rd, the 4th, the 4th and all that's coming up in March. Then there's a couple of birthdays and so forth uh, that you can look at. My daughter Amanda, uh, I'm gonna let my wife tell you about this, but she asked for prayer for her uh, current uh, activities. She's going out to uh, Saipan, is it? Guam, first. Guam and Saipan and Tinian and several other places where they had some really bad storm damage, but I'll let my wife tell you because she'll remember all the details because I don't hear. When my daughter's talking, half the stuff she says, I can't hear it. And I hear this ringing in my ear. So go ahead, Chris, tell them what it is, and then we'll have prayer. Well, there was a, a um, hurricane. Yeah. They were, they were, the water that comes, what's the water? Tsunami. Tsunami. There was a tsunami out there for more than a little less than a year, whatever, and destroyed so many homes, and then all the government, the military buildings are there. The military's been there for almost a year now, and they haven't had any kind of spiritual guidance there. No. You know, they're going to be in, in areas where uh, that have just been really, really tore up, and they really aren't sure what all the accommodations are and all that kind of thing. So they don't really know how much they're roughing it, but you know what I'm saying. You know, so. So she's kind of going like as counseling, like if they need to talk to someone about stuff. Yes. And well, yes. Yeah. Kind of that idea. Right. Yeah. But but as the army is a uh, non-denominational, shall we call it? So you go out to a group of, say, let's just for sake of argument, there's a thousand people there, and one of them's, one of them or more is Jewish. Well, I'm not a rabbi. Well, in the Pacific Theater, there are no Jewish rabbis associated with the army. There are some, but they're not out there. So you can make a phone call. We'll give you the number. You can call one that's in Seattle. But we're here. Uh, if a person is whatever denomination or religion they, that they are, they try to accommodate them, but then they hold services uh, she's for, not doing pardon? She's not doing services. No, no, she, she sets things up for the chaplain to do the things. Yeah, Amanda is the chaplain's assistant. So if they're going to have a, uh, on base, when she was in South Carolina, if they were gonna do a Jewish ceremony, she made sure the table was there and the, different hardware that they had to have to have the Jewish service. And the, the Jewish guy comes in and does it. And so she, so the, the chaplain that she's under right now is, a, is an Episcopal uh, fellow. He grew up in the Episcopal church. And so she said the way they handle their services, the, the liturgy of it's a little bit different, but she said it's good. They read the Bible and all that kind of stuff. But she said none of the chaplains Diet that she's Diet been... Catholic. Pardon? Episcopalians are diet Catholics. Yeah. But the, but the, uh, she said, none of the, none of the uh, chaplains under which she has served does what you typically see in a Baptist church. They, 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 that's not how they hold their services. They just do it differently. They don't do offerings. Well, they do offerings, but, <laughs> but we do too. <laughs> so, um, but she said it's, it's just, it's just kind of different. And uh, she said, but when they went, they, they'll go. They, I shouldn't. I should speak in the positive because it really happens. They went to one location and about 85% of the people there said, yeah, I grew up in a Baptist church. And so they weren't used to the Episcopalian type of service. She says, it's not bad, but they don't do, here's my three points and here's my sub points. And they don't do it that way. Um, they, having not been there, I don't know how they do it, but she said it's different. 
So. So they just they hold services, and then people make a choice if they want to come to. The right. Service. Nothing is mandatory. Right. And then then outside the service, if you want counseling for something, um, they do a lot of that. So whatever it would be, you're depressed, or you're happier than a clam, or how's my wife doing? She had a baby, and I haven't seen them in three years. All that kind of stuff. She's allowed to do it however the, the situation arises. Okay, she can't proselyte. She, she, yeah. She can't go out and stand on the, on the corner and say, y'all need to be Baptist right. or something like that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she, when they, somebody comes and asks her a question, she opens her Bible and says, here, 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 here. This is what the Bible says. So uh, there's nothing wrong with there's There's nothing against that. If they come to you and ask, but you can't go out and proselytize. Okay. So anyway, they're going out there, and there's been fellows out there for a little over a year working, and they haven't had a church service or anything unless a couple of guys get together for their own personal Bible study or something of that nature. Um, but uh, that's how that goes. So pray for her on that, all right? So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start our service tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We pray now, as Amanda has made the request, that you'd be with her and her chaplain and the, uh, the, the folks, men and women, that she's going to be uh, ministering to. Pray, Lord, that you'd open the door, that souls would be saved. And uh, we know, Lord, that you, we're not getting to heaven because we're Baptists or anything like that, but we, we have to trust in you and your saving power. Pray, Lord, that you'd help her in her capacity as the assistant uh, to be able to witness for you. And pray, Lord, that you'd take care of folks there and meet their needs, help them get their houses put back together and all that kind of stuff, and then keep them safe. For the name of Christ, we pray for that. And then for our service tonight, that you would be honored and, not, and you'd give me the words to say. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. So, let's get on to it here. Psalm 49, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Now, if you've noticed, I know this, this probably doesn't make any big deal to you, but that little line there, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, that's really part of verse 1. But it's the preface. Okay? But it's in there. So don't think, when you're reading the Psalms, and they have that little belief, that, that part's in there on purpose. God said, put that in there. So we know who and why and for what reason it was written. But I put them with, with the Psalm number so you can see that. So when we start with verse, in this case, verse 1, verse 1 really starts out with that little phrase. And there's a period at the end, and then David starts his Psalm. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay, verse 1, after the little introduction. Hear this, o all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. Okay, to whom is David speaking? Everybody. Who is David? He's the king of the Jewish nation. But is he just talking to the Jewish people? He said, no, everybody needs to know this. Now, if you want to do a little side study on your own, I encourage you to do this. I'll give you the seed of thought. God chose the Jewish people to be his ambassadors to the world. They didn't do a very good job of it at times. Eventually, they refused to acknowledge that, he, that Jesus was the prophecy that they'd been talking about for a thousand years. So he said, I'll put you in darkness for a time, and I'll turn my attention to the Gentile world. And my apostles and those who follow them will go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then I'll take my bride, the church, away, and I'll turn my attention back on the Jews. Will you now accept me? It takes them three and a half years of bad stuff before they finally say, oh, maybe, maybe we missed something here. But David, though, he's, he's speaking in prophecy, but he's telling people, listen, I've got something to tell you. God has given me a message, so listen. Whether you're high or low, rich or poor, everybody. This is for everyone in every nation. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and wisdom means skillful, skillfulness. And the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding, intelligence. So is David just out there rattling off something that he thinks is okay today? No, he, he's got a message from God. It's skillful, and it's intelligent. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I have talked to several people over the course of my life. Not everybody's this way, but... Uh, for the sake of the point I'm making here, I have talked to some people who really look at religious folks as being ignorant. Uh, 
was it Lenin who said that religion is the opiate of the people? Karl Marx. Karl Marx said that. It was one of those guys. It was Marx. Thank you, John. Uh, Marx says, the opiate of the people. You just get religion so you have this numb, euphoric feeling. If that's, what, if that's what religion is to you, then that's what it is. But that's not what the Bible says we're supposed to have. We're not supposed to have some gl glassy-eyed numbness euphoria. No, we're supposed to go out there and do the work of the evangelist. We're to do the work of the Christian. We're to occupy till he comes. So we're supposed to go out there with skillfulness, with intelligence, and if you really study your Bible and then apply the daily lessons that you learn outside the Bible to your life by means of biblical principles, you will be the smartest one in the room. And it will be obvious that you know what you're talking about. As John mentioned to us some time ago, uh, he and I used to work with a fellow, and the fellow would get in an argument with us, a discussion with us, whatever. And he said, I don't have to be consistent. You guys have to be consistent. I don't. Yeah. Well, how many of you ever, I have, have you ever talked to somebody every, every minute and a half, they're changing the definition of their terms? How can you have a conversation with a person who just keeps changing everything? And as soon as they don't like what, the way it's going, they say, well, that doesn't mean that anymore. No, if you study your Bible, learn the biblical principles, apply them to your life on a daily basis, you will be the, the wisest, smartest person in the room. Doesn't mean you'll no rocket surgery. But you will have the, uh, the ability to apply realism to every situation that will work out. Okay? Verse 4, I will incline, incline mine ear to a parable. The word parable is a superior maxim. He's saying, I'm going to tell you something that's like, it's a hyperbole. I'm going to tell you something that's like the real thing, but it's better than the real thing in many ways because you can understand it better than the real thing. The real thing you see, you experience it, and you don't understand it. Let me tell you a parable that will help you understand it. I will open my dark sayings. The word dark saying is puzzle or riddle. I'll open them up so you can see them. I'll speak to you in a, in a uh, uh, parable that helps you understand, and then I'll open up so you understand even the hard stuff. When you go to the book of uh, Proverbs, the first couple of verses there, it'll say something to this nature. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about the dark sayings, the things you don't understand. And even when people explain, there's still some stuff you don't understand. I'm going to talk to you about the dark sayings. Okay? The dark sayings that my father taught me. And for the a large part, not completely, but for the major part, Solomon was talking about the, was giving us the Proverbs, but they were the Proverbs of his father who was talking about the dark sayings. I'm opening up things that you didn't understand even when we were explained. Now, how can you explain something and then open up even the harder parts if you don't have wisdom and, and, and intelligence? You're thinking it through. So often we, we talk to people who are just talking off the cup. I don't want to know what you believe. I want to know why you believe it. I hear what you're saying, but why are you saying it? Well, I think, I feel. Life isn't based on our feelings. We have to get down to what is really true. Well, going on then, verse 5. <clears throat> Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of, of my heels has compassed me about? Because I am explaining things that God has given me to understand, and, I, and I'm able now to understand it to the point that I can explain it to you in parables and dark sayings, why should I be afraid when things aren't going good? When iniquity, when... when, when when it seems that my life isn't really a bed of roses, why should I be afraid? They that trust in their wealth, and the word wealth there in English is the Hebrew word that means force or might or power, they boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. That's actually talking about their financial ability. Okay? So wealth and, and riches are two different words. Those who trust in their ability, their force, their power, and they think they've got the power because they've got all the money, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give a ransom for him. For the redemption of the soul is precious, and it ceases forever. The it is referring back to the word ransom. You see they're both underlined up here on the wall. 
You can't give a ransom for the guy. As you try to redeem his precious soul, your ransom is flabby. Now that's what the Greek word means, or the Hebrew word means. It means it's flabby, it's, it's flaccid, it's, it has no oomph to it. There's no, there's, it's like trying to beat somebody with a bowl of jello without the bowl. You know, kill somebody by hitting them with a donut. You know, it doesn't work. Your, your attempt to ransom them is just flabby, it's vacuous. It ceases forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. It's not going to happen. You can't, with your force, with your, your, your power and all your money, you cannot redeem him. Because it takes more than personal power and might. It takes more than riches to redeem somebody's soul. Going on to verse 10. He that sees that wise men die... He also, likewise, the fool and the brutish person, they, they perish. Everybody dies. And whatever they had, they leave their wealth to others. Now remember, that what's the word wealth? Their ability, their power, their position, whatever it is that they had. They, we'll read it here in a second. They can't take it with them. Okay. Uh, their inward thought is, I'll build my house, it'll continue forever. And their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their names. We're going to set up a monument. What's going to be my legacy? However, nevertheless, verse 12, man being in honor abideth not. It doesn't matter how many people pat you on the back and shake your hand and sing your praises. You're going to die. As the New Testament tells us when Jesus gave the parable, he says, Okay, when you're dead, then who gets all this stuff? David already answered it in the psalm. Look at verse 13. This, their way, is their folly. I'll make a legacy. I'll, 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 I'll leave something to the next generation. People will remember me. I'll build a monument. It's folly. Yet, their posterity approved that. Oh, look at, we're at the statue. Look at the Mount Rushmore. I'm not against the presidents and national monuments. I don't mean that. But I mean, oh, yeah. the, 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 those who follow their posterity, they approve that. But you go back in history, the posterity that approves it, once it becomes a posterity that doesn't approve it, what do they do to it? They tear it down. So you go into the ancient world especially, and you find statues of used to be great kings the head's ripped off, the face is knocked out, the thing's pulled down. Here in America, that's happening. Let's, can't have that, can't look at that. Okay, doesn't matter what the value of the situation or the event or the person was in a particular thing, look at the event that happened in history and what it meant and what, what was the monument made for? Well, we'll just tear it down. Well. Those who approve of it, oh, they love it. Yeah, they put up a, it makes your granddad looks good after, 100 years after he's dead. Then they, they, David ends this portion of the psalm, verse 1 we'll call it, by saying, think about that for a while. Those of you who think you're leaving something for posterity, and everybody sits around the table and claps and applauds you, and they think you're wonderful, and they're all designing how to put a monument up for you, it's not going to last. Think about that. Then he concludes here. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The worm will eat them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. Who is going to be standing up at the end of the day? In the morning, in the next life, after you've died, and a new morning arises in the afterlife, who actually is the one that's standing there, the upright, not the powerful, not the wealthy. It does not mean that power and wealth are bad. Those who trust in power and wealth, it's not going to help them. Okay? The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. They're going to rot away. They're going to be nothing. However, God, what's his position on this? God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Now, think about that for a while. Let me ask you a question. Did David believe in life after death? 
Did David believe in the resurrection of the dead? Yeah, he says, God will receive me. When all is said and done and we all die, and those who trusted in their wealth and power are gone and rotted in the grave, God will receive me. Now think about that for a second. What are you living for? Okay? Be not thou afraid, all ye nations, all ye people. When one is made rich, don't be afraid when the glory of his house is increased. For when he's dead, he ain't taken none of it with him. His glory shall not descend after him. You can't take your money to the grave. You can't take your power to the grave. Don't be afraid when it looks like somebody's getting ahead in life and they're being successful and they're rich and all that kind of stuff. You do right. You honor God. Because nobody can take it with them. But the person who honors God, God will receive. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. He lived for himself. Remember, go back one here. When he's dead, he doesn't take anything with him. His glory doesn't go into the grave with him. Even though while he was alive, he did everything to make himself happy. He blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to yourself. Boy, look at how good he's doing for himself. I'm going to do what he's doing and make it better for me. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They'll never see light. He's going to die just like his grandpa did. Man that is in honor and doesn't have any understanding is like a beast of the field that perishes. If you've got all kinds of honor, wealth, power, applause, recognition, but you don't understand what life is all about, you're like an ox, you're like a deer, you're like a rabbit. You doesn't, doesn't pay. John, question. This is one of the passages that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to cheat soul sleep because they say that David's saying that the righteous person will, will, be, will be redeemed out of death, but the unrighteous will go to the, to the grave like the dad did, the father. They'll never see light, and they, when they die, they're like animals that die. They don't get resurrected or they're just dead. Yes. So they use this to cheat soul sleep. And in using this passage, put it up. In using this passage to present the idea of soul sleep is to take one passage and completely mistranslate it, misapply it, and say I'm going to do my doctrinal positioning on it. But you have to compare scripture with scripture to see what happens after one dies. And when you start comparing what the Bible says in other places, you have to understand again, very important: who wrote it, to whom did they write it. Why did they write it? And when the person to whom it was originally written read it, what did they think? Not what do we think today looking at it in English. Okay? And if you compare all of the scriptures, which is very important, as we've talked about many times, rightly divide the word of truth. Does the Bible ever teach anything about soul sleep? Well, if I take this and I want to make it mean this, and forget everything, yeah, okay, it teaches soul sleep if that's the way I want to discard everything else. Okay, but if I look at all the passages that talk about people when they die and what happens to them, soul sleep can't go into it. Is that a good enough generalized explanation? One thing you have to understand, whenever you're discussing, it is not our job, and this is important, it is not our job to go out and uh, theologically destroy everybody else's argument and position. It's our job to present the truth. And if a person looks at you and says, I just don't accept that, what does the Bible say? Jesus himself said this. Then die in your sin. If the only argument you have, and I say argument not in an uh, immature way, but in, in, a, in a, a, debate, a debate, if your only position is, everything that disagrees with me has to be wrong, I won't hear it. Then we can't have a discussion. That works for us, too. If somebody comes and says, well, what about soul sleep? And they come to this, will you check it out? Or will you just say, I don't believe that? Even with a little bit of explanation I gave you just a second ago, 
Will you actually check it out? You have to study to show yourself approved. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. What if they're right and I just, I'm wrong, and I think I'm right, but I, because I think what I think because, I, you know, that's, I'm a Baptist. No, check it out. Study it through. Very important for us to be personally students of the word of God. Okay? Well, that ends Psalm 49, and I am out of time. According to my clock, it's a, yeah, 7.35. So uh, if, if I do 50, we'll be here till 8.10 or so. So I'm going to stop right now. And we'll do Psalm 50 next week. Are there any other comments or questions? Have I brought any statement that caused you to question or anything or didn't make it clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because it, uh, David says, I'm going to speak in the dark saying, which is enigmatic. This, this is something that you have to parse this out. Yeah. Because the way I'm, I'm telling you, you won't get it unless you think about it. You trust in yourself. You trust in your riches. You trust in your legacy. But God's the redeemer. Yeah. And that, that's pretty much the sum of that. Jesus, I, I think about over here verse uh, 18, though while he lived, he blessed his own soul. Jesus said, yeah. verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yep. That's where it is. Yeah. It was right there, and that's where it is. If I live with my focus on this world and how much stuff I get, because whoever dies with the most toys wins, okay, I died with the most toys, I win. Oh. What did you win? Because you, you can't take any of it with you. What's he say? You got to trust God. And in, in Psalm 50, we get into that. Even though Psalm 50 and 49 are separate from each other and totally separate in their, they're self-contained, they build on each other nonetheless. They're talking about the same thematic ideas. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's have a word of prayer. And then John, you're going to help me with my computer. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your love for us. Help us now to serve you. Help us, Lord, to take our Bibles and read them. And after we read it, study it. And when we don't know what we're, what we're reading about, help us, Lord, to have the uh, humility and the uh, confidence that you will, and only you can, teach us what we need to know. Help us, Lord, to be faithful students of your word so we can represent you properly. For the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, Floyd's got an offering plate back there. You are dismissed. Give some money as you go out if you can, and that would be wonderful. And then, John, you can come up here.